All right, if you guys are watching on YouTube, let us know if you can see and hear everything okay. <laughs> All right, so Fui is on the way. Perfect. Wow, I think everyone's in and ready to go on time. Excellent. This is, this is great. This is what happens when you join, Jonathan. Well-oiled machine. Yeah. All right, everyone's in, so I'm going to get the games kicked off. All right, coming through clear. All right. So today, guys, we're doing a team match, four on four. These are classical games, 30 plus 30. I'll be kicking off the games on chess.com. And today, over here, we have the co-host, Jonathan, a.k.a. Smithy Q, um, who has a blog as well as a very popular chessable course. How are you doing, Jonathan? Doing fantastic. You know, it's Saturday. It's sunny out. What would you rather do than be here and watching some good chess? Now, are you going to be doing any, like, pull-ups, uh, hangs in between games. Be, maybe we should do a challenge. <laughs> it may be. Every brilliant move, you know, every super tactic someone finds, I think that might be pull-up worthy. Yeah, I agree. That'd be great. Okay, so I'm going to now fire off these games so we can get them going. So on board one, we have Presta J, White against Sideshow Bob with identical chess goals ratings. They're both 1577. On board two, we have Cynical with the white pieces against Jordan. Board three, we have Coriolis against RCT Fan. Coriolis playing the white pieces. And board four, we have 50 Cent against Sefuya. And 50 Cent has the white pieces. So we're alternating colors from board to board. OK. So I saw one Carolcon early on. So that prediction was that prediction. We had a free stream prediction. Yeah, we thought oh, we would I, see a lot of Carolcons today. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I did not have the Owens on here. That's interesting. That's this is our board one, yes? Yeah, this is board one. So it started E4, B6, D4. Uh, Magnus plays this a, a little bit, doesn't he, in kind of the online events? Mm -hmm. uh, or well, I know Hikaru does it from the white side a lot. Yeah, Hikaru starts 1b3, and I think Amon Hamilton might play this as well. Um, so the thing with the Owens is black is playing this sort of hyper-modern style. They're starting with the pawns only going up one square, attacking the center with pieces. Um, but the downside of an opening like the Owens is you aren't actually fighting directly for the center yet. So you're allowing white to build the big center early on, and then you have to fight back. So there's a chance of playing a bit too passive out of a system like the Owen defense. Yeah, when it works well, I know that when I've faced it and I've had problems, well, it's been kind of like this, actually, where white goes all out, gets all three pawns, completely seizes the center. And so if black doesn't do anything, well, he's, he's just worse, right? He's going to be passive. It's going to be unfortunate. But it's really easy for a d5, a c5, or an f5, even pawn break, at the right moment, it gets rid of the pawns. The b7 bishop goes right towards your king. Moving the f pawn has already weakened our king a little bit. And so if things go right for white, black has a terrible game. But if things go wrong, like things can go very wrong. So that's actually really interesting. Already uh, four moves in and uh, this, I think this is going to be a decisive game, basically. Yeah, we're, it looks like we're in for a fight. I, and I agree with everything you said. There's definitely now potential for this to just get really exciting when the center blows open. This will be good. This will be a good one. What is this? What just happened here? This is board two. Carol Khan, Bishop F5. This was not recommended in our course. We recommended 3C5. Okay. And now we see h4, the tall variation. Do you have any experience with this? So I've played this almost exclusively in Blitz. And 
I would say about 15% of black players blunder here. They play the automatic e6, and then g4 traps the bishop. And yeah, and then f3 comes. It's not as easy to play in a blitz setting, even here, just because white is moving all the pawns, like nothing but pawns, literally, for the first eight moves. And it's very easy um, to mess up because black can get bishop e7 and bishop takes h4 with the weakened diagonal once the uh, the trap goes on. Yeah, especially after an f3. Uh, but when black doesn't wonder the bishop, you know, it's interesting. I know that, okay, queen b6, interesting, look at this, eh? So is, is this blundering the bishop? Oh, bishop can go back to e6. Okay, so yeah, if the bishop goes to e4 or g6, it's getting trapped, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this was uh, Jordan's prep. So this is the current position. f4 was just played. White's going all out with this attack. So in both of our board one, board two, we have white, lots of pawn moves, completely seized in the center, and we'll see if he can hold on to it. Yeah, and this is not a game for beginners to learn from, guys. I mean, look at this. We have six pawn moves by white. No pieces developed. Uh, Black has already moved their bishop twice, and their queen is out. So we really haven't seen like any traditional development from either side in this game. But this will be another one where I think it's most likely going to be decisive. This looks like a very exciting position. All right, here's board three. We have another Karo Khan. Well, knight c3, this is kind of like the classical lines. And now we see the Tardakau, or knight to f6. So this is recommended in our course, Jonathan. We recommend probably the second or third most popular move, knight f6. Um, just trying to get a game. Usually players yeah. take that knight, and we take with the e-pawn. But now we're seeing bishop d3, and RCT fan goes right for the free pawn. Queen takes d4. What do you think about this position? So, as I mentioned to Matt, I think, privately, is that the Karo Khan is the opening I know the least about. It's the one that he wrote a course about, and so he's going to be asking me all the questions, of course. <laughs> that's that, that's how we get the best uh, instructional value. <laughs> so I know that in the, the not knight f6 version, so when black were to play bishop f5 instead, Bishop to D, yeah. Bishop to D three is also a gambit, which I believe theory says is uh, is fine, uh, in the sense that Black can take the pawn and run. But if you were to ask me to quote any details beyond that, I don't know. When I look at this Knight F six version, I would assume that it's even better for Black, just because he's that much closer to being able to castle. It does mean that an eventual E six would make his bishop. Um, caved in, so it would be more of a French bishop than a Carroll bishop, but he's up a pawn. And b6, c5 can very easily come. There's no white d-pawn to really stop that. And so getting playing an e6, b6, c5 strategy is fine. It's just going to be whether white can get enough pressure in the meantime. And so, you know, white's... Well, actually, I guess white has to do something about the knight immediately. Yeah, so I agree with everything you've said. I think it's a better version than the bishop b5 or uh, bishop f5 lines because in this case my feeling is that white is probably going to take here at some point um, like let's just say black retreats the queen all the way back to d8 this reminds me of a scandinavian except black snagged that free pawn and what does white have in return there's going to be a threat of knight takes knight after the queen retreats for black if bishop takes back all of a sudden we have a queen trade and there's zero compensation for the pawn so if queen d8 is played White probably needs to take f6. Black takes with the e-pawn, but now we have like a mainline Tardikauer, and I don't really see any compensation for white, because black will very quickly play bishop e7 in castle. And, you know, maybe white has like the extra move or two in development, but can he make use of that? Uh, I, I really don't think it'd be worth more than half a pawn. Well, queen b6. So now this will give white the option... Well, A, now um, knight takes e4 is no longer the huge worry because the queens won't automatically be traded. And so that seems to make it a bit easier for white. And bishop e3, 
maybe not necessarily this exact moment, just gambiting the second pawn, going all in, later going in, then the bishop can come to d4. You know, that, Black needs to be very careful about his development here. You know, I'm a big believer in snagging pawns. I think that's fine. I think it's very easy to go overboard. And my experience, I, I remember being a 1300 player, 1400 player, and playing gambits was easy. Accepting gambits and surviving, uh, that was much less easy. So <laughs> this will be interesting. Yeah, and I think a good rule of thumb a lot of times with these gambits is to just take one pawn with your queen and then get back to safety. Like almost always that second pawn is a poison pawn and it really can get your queen into trouble. So I think Jonathan had a really good point here. Um, if white just plays hyper aggressive and goes after this queen, that's where all of a sudden you're going to see this scenario where it's like black has just the one knight developed on f6 and white all of a sudden has every minor piece developed, a rook coming in the game. Um, and that queen could very easily become trapped in just a few moves. And I think that's why my instincts in this position said, let's just put the queen right back on d8. Let's yeah. not put the queen on any square that white can target us with development. And I think that's a point that a lot of players don't always think about is if I put my queen somewhere, can my opponent attack it while improving their position? It is odd in the sense that we tell people we want to develop our pieces and moving your queen out and then bring it right back it's it's not developing a piece it's undeveloping but at the same time you're a pawn and so that that changes things that allows you to do things a little bit different you still want to focus on development but we also want to be able to um i guess it's the focus becomes consolidation at that point consolidate first get everything safe you can then finish development calmly and then we're okay right so this one i think I mean, three, three exciting games, right? Because now yeah, we have this, this pawn difference. All right, let's go to the board number four. This is 50 Cent playing the white pieces against Sifuya with the black pieces. And here we get a Roy Lopez, kind of refreshing. Exchange variation. Uh, early H3. I'm not really up on my theory. Uh, do you play the Roy Lopez for either color? Uh, not in the last decade or so. Okay, I, I think it is a move, I'm pretty sure. Because um, I know bishop g4 is a common idea here for black. Okay, so this is the end. This is the game position. Bishop b4 is just played. So we see that there's this immediate threat on e5 to win a pawn. But black is threatening to take this knight back and win the pawn in return. So what do you think mm -hmm. about this position? So. I rarely like moving a piece twice in the opening, bishop to d6, then going to b4, when it could have went to b4 in the, at, at one go. Not that bishop b4 would have been especially good back on move uh, five, right? But so my instincts, again, knowing nothing about the Roy Lopez, <laughs> would have been to just, just chop on d4. Don't let white have the center. Don't give him the options of, uh, yeah. Because that opens up, we have the two bishops, it, it then we can start playing uh, rook to e8. We already have the knight on the f6. Is uh, Yeah, they're targeting the pawns. Uh, we can later play c5, b6, bishop to b7 if we have to. Or, yeah, that's, that's it. It's just, in my experience, playing these e4, e5s, I find things go... When black ignores the central te tension, especially when white has not had to play c3, and you just let white have those pawns on e4 and d4, it seems like the coming complications, they just help white so much more. Because he already he has the center, he has the extra time. It's If something goes wrong for either color, I think it could go wrong worse for black. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Because I think if you evaluate this in terms of the imbalances in the position, White has the advantage with the center, and white also has the advantage with the pawn structure. We see these double pawns for black, which could be a potential problem in the end game. Um, and if you look at the advantages for black, black probably wants to play for this bishop pair to be active. So I agree with you. I think, if, you know, keep the bishop on d6, snatch this pawn on d4 is probably the way to go. 
Um, I guess you do have to think about the immediate fork, but I think, you know, the idea of trading this bishop for the knight is not something I would want to do because that's the one advantage black has in the position mm. of the bishop pair. Um, so maybe even a move like rookie eight. Rookie eight or, I mean, it does allow this trade, so I don't know. It's actually kind of tricky. Like maybe knight, knight d7 could have even been an option. Mm. And if pawn takes, take back with the knight. But yeah, I, I really don't want to trade off this bishop unless it's a scenario where black feels like they're just equalizing the position. And maybe that's the case here. Yeah, I guess it's one thing to talk about generalities, but then you have to say, okay, <laughs> this concrete move, what do you do? It's like, okay. Yeah, I, I feel like white has a, a small pole here already. And this is the board where, um, well, actually boards three and four, we have larger rating differences than one and two. So this is a board where 50 cent is lower rated by almost 500 points um, on chess.com ratings. And on chess goals ratings, it's about a 300 point gap. So nice start by white here. I, I really kind of like 50 cents position. Yeah. And, it, and black, he didn't rush this move either. He spent quite a bit of time. I, I can't see it on my screen, but. It, oh, three minutes, 50 seconds. Yeah. Right. So this was not a rushed move. All right, let's go back to circle around to board number one. Well, there's the d5 move. That you, so you were talking about black breaking in the center, and Bob also played bishop to b4, pinning this knight, which increases the pressure on the e4 pawn. So really, I kind of like the transition from when we looked at this last to the current for black, and I think all of a sudden black has a lot of pressure on the center. Yeah, in, in a perfect world... Uh, white gets in that e5 move, and it becomes a great French, but the knight doesn't need to retreat. We've got, yeah, knight e4, the bishop on b7 is coming through, the bishop on b4 pinning the c3 knight. And then if there's an exchange on e4, that is when things are starting to opening up. And then that's where white spending those three moves, getting those pawns in. Yeah, okay, here it is. And this position gets interesting, too, because after knight e4, I feel like white is probably going to take. Pawn takes back, and then white will see, can I take advantage of this potential weakness on e4? And black's going to be thinking, well, I got this really active bishop mm -hmm. pair. Um, you know, can I just open up the board and use the bishops to attack? Maybe even move like c5, yeah. trying to trade off d4 and bring this bishop back later. There's... Once the, I'm assuming the knight will land on e4, and then if you leave the knight there, all of a sudden the queen h4 check ideas. Yeah, because the knight can just uh, chop on g3, uh, the rook is pinned, and we could see the disadvantage of playing f4 instead of knight f3. Yeah, so going all the way back here, yeah, maybe white should have played more solid, just get the pieces developed. Now, I, uh, I'm going to sort of confess that I've played the f4 move quite a bit in Blitz, and I fell victim to the queen h4, and so that's how you never forget these things. <laughs> yes. You lose a really tough game, and then you're like, all right, that's never happening again. So that's a good... Okay, so we have dual uh, two threats here, two immediate threats. Black either is going to win a pawn on c3 or get this queen h4 move. Um, and because there's both of those threats occurring at the same time, and I don't see a way to stop both... I think white is forced to take. But then after pawn takes, how do you get this g1 knight developed? I, I really like black's position so far. This feels good for black. All right, let's go. <laughs> this, this board number two, we see more pawn moves. Uh, so we left it at this point. f4 was played. We see c5, f5, forcing the bishop back c3 and now black is playing e6 all of a sudden we've switched from a caro Khan to some sort of french defense structure bishop d3 and knight c6 mm. is played what do you think so i my thought instead of knight c6 would have been to play bishop to b5 and immediately trade off uh that bishop a because that's the only developed piece that white has so might as well punish him immediately just trade it off but more, it's, we don't have the normal Carol Khan bishop. And I I know there are some French lines where 
black will play a queen b6 or an early a6 and then try and trade the bishop on uh, b5 and here we could have done that immediately and that eases our cramp it gets rid of our worst uh, our worst uh, our worst minor piece get ri gets rid of his good bishop and the queen it doesn't sit too poorly on that uh, light diagonal yeah i agree with you so so bishop b5 if I'm playing white there, maybe I go bishop to c2, but then this b5 bishop is really annoying. Cuts off this diagonal, doesn't allow castling. I don't know if white's castling anyways, but it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty well-placed bishop on b5 all of a sudden for black. Um, this is There is an interesting point here. At first I was thinking, after bishop d3, could black take this pawn on d4? It looks like a free pawn, right? It takes back. Mm queen takes and there's no checks from this bishop but i think what the players calculated was after taking d4 white could potentially take on e6 and if black takes back with pawn there's this bishop check in the end to win black's queen and if black takes with bishop there's a bishop check over here to win the queen so a lot of tactics early i, I bet both players looked at that because they both spent over three and a half minutes three and a half and four and a half minutes on their last two moves The one, the one worry I have for Black is that if he can't get any queenside counterplay, he might just smother under those pawns on the king side. That's kind of like the ideal French for white is where you're just able to get all that space and then Black sits there and does nothing. So, hmm. I have a prediction. I yes. think white's going to go for this big attack, take on e6, black will take back. So white will do something solid here. Let's just say knight e2, defend this pawn an extra time. What's going to then happen is there's going to be a trade on e6, and white's going to be thinking, okay, I have this huge attack coming over here at the black king. And it's going to be one of those French defenses where black goes c4, queenside castle, and then all of a sudden the f file is blacks to use to attack. It's kind mm -hmm. of like the rope-a-dope in boxing or whatever, where black is just waiting for white to come at the king side, and then he's going to say, oh, I'm going queen side. See you later. <laughs> and then counter punch in the king side. Well, yeah, castling king side is, uh, that's a no-go right right here. That's that'd be, that'd be silly. And it'd be really hard, actually, to just find a way to develop our king side in any way where we don't just get hit by the pawns. Yeah, it's almost like getting hit by a bus if you, if you yeah. castle king side here. All right, so I I think I still kind of like White's position just due to the flexibility. You know, in terms of this pawn tension, I think White has the advantage. Um, Black really doesn't want to take here at any point, so White has options, right? They can sit with this pawn. They can, oops, they can take e6, or they could push it later. So all these extra options with the tension for White, I think, really just favors the, the White center. Yeah, I think if both sides just play, you know, normal moves then white's extra space will start mattering. Black will need to find a way. It's either direct counterplay, winning a pawn, or uh, as you said, perhaps castling a uh, uh, queenside and just having you know a bit more chaos reign. I think that would help. And the one thing, I mean, we're talking about the virtues of white's position. Where's his king gonna go? If the center opens up, if the king side opens up, he's not safe there and white uh, doesn't have the extra space on the queen side. That's a really good point. And I think if you listen to what Jonathan's saying, like this is the intuition of a strong player. Like we know from the black point of view, the position is just getting cramped. And if we do nothing, white has all the advantages. But the one advantage that we have is the king's safety for the white king. And what we can do is try to make things crazy. So maybe what black will do is queen side castle and even play a move like f6. And say, okay, my king is now safer than yours on the queen side. I'm just going to do everything in my power to open up the center because I need to get something going. I can't let you just solidify everything and slowly crush me in a passive position. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, this so two really exciting games. Oh, and this one, look what happened. <laughs> bishop e3, you called it. Queen takes b2, bishop d4, queen a3, and castle for white. Wow, a lot of development for the cost of two pawns. Yeah, so 
all the minor pieces. That's great. Center is completely open. Um, that could be good. It's at the same time, we have to be extremely uh, concrete here. So here's my general la 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 <laughs> general principles. Okay, white, now we actually need to prove something. But look at the black position. So to get this bishop out, one pawn needs to move. <laughs> but currently, you would lose a pawn on f6. Yeah. It's double attacked. So that makes you think that white or that black should start with the trade. But now all of a sudden, there's no minor pieces developed for black. Uh, this bishop is still eyeing the rook, which makes it really awkward to get the f8 bishop out. There's no g6 after that. e6, the bishop moves. This g pawn can even be captured. Wow, I feel like white has a lot of play in this position for the two pawns. I, I like white's position here. Yeah, so I, because of the difficulty that you just described, knight, yeah, knight to d7, reinforcing the knight, because uh, then that allows you to play the e6 and the bishop uh, e7. <clears throat> it does mean it's another turn in the center. At the same time, after, say, rook e1, Like the knight's defended, the e-file isn't completely open, the bishop and the, and the queen, they're all making sure e7 is okay. And if black does play e6, I know that there are some variations in um, the Karo Khan where white is able to sacrifice a piece on f7 or, or on e6, and there's just nothing immediate there right now. There's no easy... Um, there isn't a knight on g5 or a knight on d4 that can easily sacrifice itself. And so at the same time, white is fully developed. And so spending a turn playing, say, knight g5 or knight e5, okay, there we go, just chop it off. Yeah, I, I kind of liked your line with the knight d7 because maybe I was too quick to enjoy white's attack because if knight d7 is played, there wasn't really an immediate go for the kill from white's point of view and it seemed like after a couple of moves black is getting to safety um, but now these bishops look very active i'm not sure about this for black yeah so this might become less of a, an immediate attack okay well, that's right. actually that might be good before a rook b1 would have stopped it maybe rook b1 now because I like this long-term bishop pair advantage. Rook b1 develops and hits b7. And how does black respond to that? Because I don't think you... Yeah, you don't want to allow this rook coming in for sure. Queen takes so, a2, looks too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do... Rook b1, let's say, I imagine black played bishop because he wants to trade. Okay, maybe. So what I was thinking here is that white played that because if black were to take on f3, he wants to take with the queen, developing another piece. And he couldn't do that before because black would have just traded queens. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that's the only reason I can see to play c3. Mm -hmm. And it does make sense. You know, get this queen active. All of a sudden, she's ready to start attacking these king side pawns for black. And that's got to be where the black king goes, which is looking scary. This might become a position in which, okay, yeah, white wants to attack, but maybe it could be just one where it's one of those positional binds. Because if rook b1 comes... You know, how do you defend b7 without being really passive? If you play, yeah, then all of a sudden this, the knight is forced to defend c6. Um, that um, The bishop and the queen are on the long diagonal, so that could be doing tactics against the rook. Yeah, I'm stuck in the corner. So even if the attack doesn't come right away, it's just white is so active, it's going to be hard for black to do anything except stay solid. And... This could be some long-term pressure. Whether it's worth two pawns, I don't know. It's certainly worth one pawn. Yeah. So that, that does suggest that if white can win back one pawn, then he's probably doing okay. Right. If you give white one pawn back, so they're only down one, 
with the bishop pair, with the activity, with the open files, um, I, yeah, I think white has more than a pawn worth of compensation. But the question is, does he have two pawns worth? So I think that transition is what white wants to go for. Win one pawn and keep all the pressure. Because I'm looking at this from black's point of view thinking, if I could give up one pawn safely as black, maybe that would be worth it. But I don't see a good way to do it. I don't see a way that we can just give up one pawn and somehow get our king safely on g8. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like we're liking white here. A black is the one who has to prove himself right now. So let's go to the fourth board. Oh, okay. We had some trades here too. So bishop, we left with uh, bishop to b4, rookie one. We see this trade in the center. Okay, this doesn't seem too bad for black. We see both bishops are now active. Uh, even though one's still on c8, he has potential long term. And all of a sudden, there's this pressure on the e pawn. So white pushes, c5, knight f3, and this is the game position currently. Hmm. It's hard to evaluate. This bishop is kind of blocked in, boxed in by its own pawn, which is a yeah. little uncomfortable. I might take C3, transition into that endgame. So taking on C3, the one thing is that it gives up the, the uh, our bishop pair. But it is hard because we have played C5, with the bishop on B4, right? I mean, if white were to play A3, um, just say, like, even if the bishop were to go back to A5, there is not a huge amount of uh, potential right now. So taking on C3 does make sense. The double pawns, though, I mean, the queen side is actually, I don't know if I've seen four C pawns in uh, in quite a while. It's, But even though, yeah, but they're all doubled because it's a closed file. You know, there's no queens. Surprisingly hard to attack. So what if I go for a quick attack with the knight? So take, take, knight d5. And then my plan is to expand queen side with b5. Mm -hmm. And maybe even try to fix your pawns back here. Yeah, I think, okay, and then we're going for it. It just might be one of those situations where it's like, if you don't go for this chance, then it, it goes away. Yeah. Yeah, if uh, the line you quoted, if white can get in, sorry, if black could get in the c4 and b5, yeah, those, those, with the knight on d5, yeah, that would be, uh, that's an extremely weak pawn. Yeah, like I want to see white play one passive move there, like bishop to b2, which would be pre a pretty common looking mistake. And then lock it in with c4 and then, you know, moves like bishop f5 and this pawn's getting attacked. So we see the initiative is really in black's court all of a sudden. Yeah, my, my first instinct would just be to play c4, bishop to b2. Um, but then the bishop on b2, it is actually that active. I mean, it's it's a great diagonal, but the e five's in in the way, and the uh, the e five pawn it just it does. I don't see how it's going to be moving anytime soon. And so the bishop it's it's just sitting there defending. Yeah, and I was hoping I could go after this real quick with knight b six. Yeah, make it tough for you to defend it. Yeah, if white has to play knight to d two, you know, really uh, contorting himself, that's not what you want. Right, and then bishop f five, bring the other rook to d eight. Yeah, yeah, black's play knight. flows. All right, so I was a little critical of that bishop yeah. b4 move Close. on move 8, but <laughs> this this turned out really well. The bishop was perfectly placed, eyeing that rook on e1 and the knight on c3. It's kind of became a problem for white. And we did see knight d5. Okay, so let's do a quick um, like 10-second recap of each game and maybe just talk about just who we think has the advantage on each board and how large it is, kind of get a summary of that. So this is the board 1. And the, the player on the bottom is always Team Presta J. I forgot to mention that earlier. The player okay. on the top is always Team Sideshow. So I'm following everyone from uh, Team Presta J. So this one, I think I would say we're kind of almost in just like a standard French now. I would say this is about equal. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I, I'm actually... I do believe it is a standard French. I think white has a bit more pull because 
Um, Black would have wasted time putting his bishop on b7, which isn't very useful in a French. And if the diagonal isn't open, that's not great. And f5 might be coming. Okay, I change. Yeah, I agree with you. You convinced me. White's coming pretty quickly, and it, it feels like Black is behind by a couple moves for a French. Like that should already be on c5. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I even like this structure with the bishop here. There's no like queen a5 ideas. All right. So we were it... really excited when we were talking about lines with white taking on e4, and it looks like that didn't happen. So yeah. black um, initiated exchanges on c3, and that really changed the nature of the position. I wonder if queen h4 here should have been played. Oh, is there that trick though? So there's, the, you know, the trick where... Uh, you take on g3 and then the other side just plays the queen over. Mm. But here there's knight back to f5. Bishop take wouldn't work because queen takes f2 would be with check. Yeah, it's Maybe. a lot of Hikaru arrows, but I think in the end, black is uh, gaining that pawn. Mm -hmm. Okay, that might have been a missed opportunity. I think queen h4 check here was pretty good looking. Yeah, isn't I think that was our conclusion. This is more than ten seconds, but <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, th I think we said that White could not stop both taking on c three and the queen h four. Right. Okay, so mm -hmm. in the game position, we're we're thinking uh, advantage White here. Oh. oh, there we go. Look at that. All right, board two. Oh man, this one's getting crazy. So material still even. Um. Now I like black. I think this is exactly what black wanted. Center is getting opened up. And this yeah. king is losing some king safety. I think we said that chaos would favor black, while normal moves would favor white. And since the last time we looked at this, this looks a lot more chaotic, a lot less normal. And so, yeah, I think black likes this more than white likes it. All right. So we got one advantage for each side on the first two boards. Here's board number three. And we see black trying to get that last bishop developed. Um, do you still like white here? Oh my, this is... So my inner Morphe is saying, spend some time looking at rook e1. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to he play to e5. Oh, e6 would have been such a safer idea. You know, I mean, I'm already down a thousand pawns. Let's just go all in. Because then I have a bishop uh, check anywhere. I don't know if it works, but I really want to look at it. I would even consider rook takes b7 here. Yep. And then like bishop takes c6 yep. and rook e1 check. Uh, I, white, I, I like white here. <laughs> white has to, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. At the same time, white must do something dynamic. And so there, oh. There we go. Okay. Like so, pull up worthy, oh dear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we need a uh, fourth board. This is the one where we kind of liked black, I think. Nothing's changed in this position. Yeah. Okay, so so we have, uh, let's see, from team press to J. So looking at the players on the bottom, we have a slight advantage here. We think an advantage here. We think an advantage here. And in this side, Advantage? Is that an advantage on all four boards? Yeah, it is. Okay, so we like Team Press to Jay on all four boards, but none of them are decisive yet. None of them no. where it's like, oh, the other side just busted. Okay, this one, let's go to the more exciting positions. <laughs> let's go to more exciting. Either, I, okay, I, I want to look at this because we have some tactics coming up, and this is yeah. a game where it could end in a couple of moves depending on what happens. So we got to look at Pawn Takes Bishop. Pawn takes bishop. So here are you thinking, do you want to start with rook e1, or do you want to go for c6, or or would you even consider like sacking the rook? Well, rook takes d7 is barely even a sacrifice, with bishop takes c6 coming in with a fork right after. But that's trading an attacking piece. And our rook on uh, the seventh rank is great. So the first move I would be looking at would be bishop takes c6. Then, yeah, because that he has to do something about that. We can then play rook e1. He probably has to play f6. So, I mean, yeah, so rook can slide over. So that pawn is already hanging on e5. Mm. 
I almost wonder if we could just pile up queen, on that d7 knight. Queen f5 or yeah. g4. Queen back. You know what I'm wondering, though? that This rook takes line, even though it's offering a bunch of trades, because we're winning that... Well, I don't know where the black king would go. But because we're winning this rook right away, and black has to take time to win the bishop back... You look at that end position, um, the material is exactly even. And we have queen, oh, wow. bishop, and rook all out in the open attacking for white. I, I think this is almost over already. Like This is close to checkmate if queen c6 check and our rook comes in next. Mm. like This might just be game over. Rook takes d7. So if I'm playing this in a classical game, I might just spend you know 20 minutes looking at rook takes d7 and if it works i'm maybe even not looking at the slower lines okay he in for a penny two. in for a pound okay Oof. did we rule out the queen sacks queen takes f7 okay <laughs> <laughs> all right this is hard to deal with rook d8 but black is up a piece. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So the pawns are even. It's simply a piece. King's in the center. Uh, Rook d8 looks forced. Unless, can black queenside castle here? Yeah, I was just looking at that myself. <laughs> you know that's a puzzle position, right? Where, uh, where queenside castling suddenly saves the day. I mean, does that work? If it works, that's pretty crazy. Oh, my. No, I think there's bishop takes knight, rook takes back, and queen c6 check. Right, it's queen side castle, yeah. bishop takes knight. That's all forced. Good. Okay, good. We or maybe not good, out. but uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, sorry, it's like my inner like chess principle. It's just everything suggests that black's been too greedy in this game, mm -hmm. and so white should not lose it right like I, I don't know if white is winning my instinct says that white should have something uh, decisive just because the king it's wide open look how that e file is open all right i have a line uh, for you what, what if bishop t so rook d8 bishop takes knight yep rook takes back rook b8 and if the rook goes back to d8 queen c6 check Ooh. the king has to move and then this rook is coming in and i think it's over oh, he went for Ooh. it Okay, this so this game, if we look at the ratings, this is one of our rating imbalance games. So both sides had like a 300-point gap for the chess goals ratings. This one, I think, uh, Team Sideshow, so the top players, I think they really need this win based on the ratings. So let's see if Coriolis finds this line. Bishop takes yeah. d7. Rook takes, queen comes in. It's a forced Running. checkmate, right? It's like I don't know. Forced... After king d8. Oh, of course. Right. Yeah, that's a rook there. I, I think it's mate in three because there's there's no other move besides rook takes pitch. Yeah, the queen helps protect the rook. That's uh, very important. Yeah, so either rook blocks or king moves in its mate. We could have our first result here. We're 45 minutes in. Wow, what an attack by white. Very impressive. Let's replay this. Can we start from the beginning? Yeah. So we got Carol Khan. And here Black got slightly greedy, but I think this is correct. And Black should yeah. have the advantage. This was the first move where we thought maybe Queen D8. It should be three. And then the bishop is able to come to D4 with tempo. Queen goes to another unfortunate square where it's been stuck ever since really out of play oh we got our arrows telling us what we thought <laughs> might have happened and we were completely wrong <laughs> so here okay so here maybe a knight takes e4 could be improved upon as well yeah i think black has the right idea trade down but the problem is he's so far behind in development that right now right he has one minor piece developed versus black's uh, white's uh, four once he trades, 
then he has zero minor pieces developed, White's three. And so oddly enough, I think White's activity actually increased relative to Black's after that. I agree. Looking at this now, I kind of like Bishop to G4. And really? if knight takes knight, maybe we take with the G pawn and just try to keep the king tucked in the center for a while. Because bishop g4, you know, at least we're getting another piece out. We're tying down a piece from white's yeah. attack. Um, and there's no, like, tactics on the f7 pawn yet, so no, we're not worried about it. So I think it was just a couple kind of small inaccuracies in a row that added up for black. This is why playing gambits is fun. Because it's a lot, those inaccuracies, they add up to big attacks when you're the gambiter and really unhappy positions when you're uh, trying to defend. Well, so here's an interesting question for you. Uh, if you're playing someone that's 300 points higher rated, what are your thoughts on the strategy of playing aggressive versus solid? Like, do you change your approach if someone's, let's say, 300 points above you? So I try and play my game regardless if I can. But I do know in experience, when I'm facing someone 300 points lower than me, I love when they just sit there. Mm -hmm. when, when they play normal, because I eventually will play them. That's just how, and there's very little risk. Whereas when they're coming at me with the Evans Gambit or what have you, things become real. And it's very easy to sweat a little bit. And sometimes I swear, it's like the lower rated players um, it's almost as if they don't see anything and then I'm seeing all these phantoms or whatever and I have no idea if they're seeing these brilliant sacrifices or attacks, but I have to worry about them. Um, and so given the choice, you know, if they're, I wouldn't say change things. I, I would not just change just because I'm against, but I, I have the choice between, you know, aggressive versus normal. I might favor aggressive and it leads to some fun games. I, so I agree with you. Um, and there's a new book out by Axel Smith. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, but it's like a chess psychology. And I know one of the chapters is on playing high-rated opponents. And their recommendation is to play aggressive. And they follow one of the players. Do you have the book? No, I have a different one. Uh, so uh, Chess for Tigers. This is, a, this is an old classic. And okay. I'm pretty sure it recommends the same thing. Yeah. Um, when you're against uh, much lower rated players, he calls them rabbits, right? How does a tiger hunt a rabbit? It's really easy, right? <laughs> How do you hunt an elephant? You got to lead it into the swamp. Then it will drown in the tar pit. So uh, same general idea. Yeah. So uh, I just looked it up. The book is called Street Smart Chess by Axel Smith. Mm. Um but yeah, I agree with because when I'm facing a low rated player, I actually like when they play solid, like you said, because I feel that just comes down to who has a better general understanding of chess. But when it's like crazy tactics left and right, and I don't feel that like I'm necessarily weak at tactics, but it's, you know, there's a lot more variance in the game, it feels like, and that can favor the lower player. Um, and I've seen yeah. even like Magnus Carlsen, you look at some of the players that beat him. And it'll be like when a 2650 goes all out and just makes a crazy game and he'll lose. And everyone's shocked by it, but you watch the style of play and it's like, well, that 2600 just played really aggressive um, and that paid off. So Coriolis missed the mate. Unless we missed something. Queen takes F7 was played. So now Queen E7 comes back. I mean, Queen takes F7 is so tempting because it adds another defender against uh, another attacker onto that d7 knight. And, you know, if the knight moves, then queen c7 would be mate. That'd be really nice. But uh, queen e7, I'm assuming, I can't think of anything else. Queen jumps back to c4, I suppose, afterwards. I feel like black is getting out of this now. Can, can I get away with bishop e7? So I do like queen e7, but I also want to get the rook into yeah. the game. And this queen could maybe come back to d6 for black. You know, like let's say bishop here, queen goes somewhere attacking the knight, and then queen to d6. I'd want to play rook b1. 
getting the last piece in, threatening maybe some something on D8. Oh, that's a really cool uh, threat. Yeah. Rook B8 here, and you could mate on B7. Or you do it the opposite. Oh, sorry, the bishop be on E7. But some sort of... I was, I was... Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't yeah. be mate. But yeah, bishop E7, maybe you can just sit on this a little bit and, and keep improving the position. Like rook F8, queen comes here, and there's now there's probably threats on uh, rook B8 yeah. check. Okay, so maybe black's not out of the woods yet. Um, but it's not mate. Yeah, but it's not mate. We had that immediate mate that was missed by white. All right, let's go to board four. We see white here is down to eight minutes on the clock. Um, so what happened in the last couple of moves? Oh, yeah, we talked about this line. So bishop d2, black is playing active, keeps attacking these pawns. And here's c3. White's just giving up a pawn because I don't think he could do anything else. No. Uh, but now there's this monster knight on c4. All right, what do you think? Ooh. So <laughs> the game that we're most critical of, it's like, oh, that bishop d4 was terrible. It's actually worked out incredible. And it'd be interesting to go back and see exactly where white went wrong because it seemed as if all this, like here, I'm thinking, oh, white, you're just really, really happy. And then you flash forward literally 10 moves, and it's like White's fighting for his life. He's down a pawn. Black has perfect coordination. Uh, I think giving up the pawn was smart. Um, getting the bishop to f4, it's like doing more than it's on d2. Uh, the extra pawn is a doubled c pawn, so it's not the easiest thing in the world. This is far from, uh, you know, just a walk in the park. But... I'd yeah. be very confident if I were black. It's certain, I think it, this is, we're in like two resolve territory, right? White holds a draw, or black is going to uh, okay, h6. That's a nice move. I was thinking about this in the same way. This is a position where if I was playing black, it, it feels like I'm never going to lose. Um, either win or draw if things don't go well. But h6, really nice move. This actually kind of reminds me of like a Berlin move, h6. Like just controlling the g5 square. Don't allow the white pieces in there. Who knows? Maybe you need this bishop to come back. Maybe you need room for the king. Yep. Uh, and g5 is an idea as well. It is. It's despite being an open position, that f4 bishop, there isn't a good spot for it. it like, it's really struggling to find anything active. Even yeah. if it goes to a3, well, a3 would be taken by the knight. But even that diagonal, you just play b6 and you stop it, and. You contrast that with the beautiful f5 bishop. I almost want to play knight d2 here. Just trade off that knight. Try to get trades, but then it feels like we're reducing our winning chances for white. Oh, you know, maybe, okay, so maybe what white needs to do here, you know, kind of going back to like static versus dynamic advantages, like white needs to, to mix up the nature of this position. Black is just really just controlling everything. Maybe white needs g4. Let that bishop you know, park on this home that he wants to probably go to anyways. But then let's try to get this f4 pawn rolling. Because mm. the advantage that white has is the four versus three king side. Yeah. And I think really it's critical here to try to get that that advantage going. Otherwise, white's got, or black's got everything in the position. And if the bishop were, if after g4, say, the bishop stayed and he went back to h7, then all of a sudden um, e6 could come where the bishop x-rays down onto c7. The bishop suddenly has a diagonal, uh, and black has lost a little bit of control. And so in terms of uh, making a move, yeah, the, the g4 gives chance. I don't know if bishop h7 would be a mistake, but it, it gives uh, black a chance to lessen his control that he has right now. Yeah, and it's also like another way to you know, pose your opponent with a semi-tough question, right? Every yeah. time you make an, your opponent... <laughs> I'm going to mute for a second. <laughs> Fantastic. I will finish the thought then. <laughs> right. And so I, I'm assuming, and I guess we'll just have to hope that Matt understands <laughs> what's going on. I don't repeat anything or he doesn't repeat anything that I say. Is that, again, if white just sits here and does nothing, then black can slowly improve his position and he's up the extra pawn, trade everything and he has all the chances. 
and you know I'm imagining I can't draw arrows, but you imagine the bee pawns uh, moving on the queen side. Um, he's going to eventually get a pass pawn over there, and so if White can do something that isn't normal, so to speak, that isn't just going with the flow, that increases the chance of something going wrong. And there's kind of an art to that, I find. Are you back, Matt? Yeah, FedEx came, package got delivered. <laughs> H4. Oh, I kind of like that move too. Um, but it makes it harder to play G4 later. Yeah. Actually, H4 is a move where I feel like if white had the advantages, you would play a move like H4. Just like, okay, I'm going to keep my control. Oh, I see. He's really worried about the G5 advance. That, so he's trying to stop that. But in doing so, now G4 is weak. Yeah, yeah it just it gives that bishop another uh, square. And just strategically, it's just it's another pawn on a dark square for uh, the same color bishop as, uh, as white. So how would you press this advantage as black? Would you start with bishop e6 or push the queenside pawns? So interesting, you know, you want to play b5 at some point. The, the c5 pawn is a little bit weak, but the knight on uh, c4, it stops the bishop from attacking it. I don't see how the knight can maneuver to attack it very easily. And then even just something simple like king f8, just bring the king a bit closer to the center. Um, I would probably want to trade rooks, like all the rooks, because a rook end, rook end games are, are terrible. You can be up a pawn, active king, you still a draw because all rook end games are draws. <laughs> yeah, you don't so, want to just rook only end game up a pawn. That's a really good point. What do you think of bishop c2? I, I was just looking at different options for black, and this is really jumping out at me now because if we can force white to trade... yeah. Um, I guess we do have to kind of calculate this e6 break, but what I wanted to do was force white to trade and then sink our rook into d3 and get the rook really active. But it would be nice to blockade that e-pawn first somehow. Yeah, I would like to get the king to e6. He's safe uh, there too. There's no knight, no knight yes, checks. Yes, that's exactly... Uh, and it's not like the knight can come to f4. And if the... If that pawn is blockaded, then the bishop on f4 is never getting happy. We could then safely trade rooks. Yeah, so there, it seems like there's quite a few ways to play this for black, because he doesn't have to play quickly, um, and there's a lot of time in the position. That's it. You could also, you know, using the, the John Bartholomew School of Chess, use the clock as a weapon, because... He has a very large lead in time, and White's position is the one that's unpleasant. And so it's much easier for White to rush or make mistakes, well, just because his position is worse, but also he has less time to think. And so little simple moves like King F8, it almost passes the move to White, and, and that can be a, a difficult thing. That's a, that's a really good point. Um... So this is something, if you're watching and your rating's below 2,000, like, take note of this. If you're facing an opponent who's like an expert master level player, oftentimes they may make a move like King F8 because they know they don't have to do anything quick, and players that are less than 2,000 might make mistakes where they just overreact. They really try to make something happen. They push a pawn, create a weakness. Um, so sometimes your stronger opponents might let you beat yourself. So be aware of that. You know, you see a move like king f8, don't do something too crazy. Don't just play like a4 and all of a sudden like you're blundering your pawns on the queen side, <laughs> right? Okay, let's go back. Let's switch back to uh, board one. So we left this with queen g4, g6, I think. And we see black got safely over to the queen side, but there is that half open b file. Now we get opposite side castling. Okay, this is going to be fun. So opposite side castling, both sides will look to attack the opponent's king. Yeah, this side's, this game's actually, it's not gone the way that I was expecting for normal French. Now it's not knight a5 blocking the file. It's, 
in my short experience uh, playing the Winnower, uh, I really like the French Winnower, which has sort of this pawn structure. I really don't like every other French variation. <laughs> so that's why you don't play the, uh, the French. But I have found it's very difficult for white to really make something in these types of things often. Uh, now in this particular case, he has uh, knight b3, which will break up the, uh, the blockade. But it's often frustrating how this sort of queenside pawn structure doesn't make it easy to attack. Uh, yeah, the knight can uh, jump into c4, and that'd be exactly where the knight wants to go. Yeah, this feels pretty solid for black all of a sudden. So we were saying we didn't like black's position um, because of all the space and the play that white had. But I feel like he's done a good job because all of a sudden, like you said, it's just really hard to crack this position. And if the d pawn ever lands on c4... The bishop becomes very happy. Yeah. I think g6 was a very good move by black. It stopped f5. And it came after queen g4. Um, because now the queen would have to move again. You'd have to play g4 and then f5 to try and open something up. And that seemed to have given, and then, well, A, white hasn't done that. And B, it just seems to have given black time to be okay. So should white have gone for this push more quickly? F5 and open things up quick. I think uh, either that. Yeah, F5 looks really good, eh? Yeah, I kind of think F5 was maybe a critical move here. Because this seems to help Black. I think Black wants G6 in this position anyways. Yeah. Um, and there was this nice move by Black here, Queen E7, because uh, there's no way for White to get on this diagonal and stop the Queen side castling. So really, it's just kind of covering everything. And it encouraged this move a3, which prevents queen a3. So it was like, with Tempe, black is getting the king to safety. Mm -hmm. And that a pawn had to move a second time. Okay, I like this move though, queen e2. Going for an immediate bishop a6. I didn't think of that at first. So, so yeah, the one thing is, as hard as it might be, or how about, I'll say it better, it might not be straightforward for white to attack immediately. I don't see an attack for black in this opposite side colored uh, position. Does h6, g5 really work? I don't know. Does that really help? I can't white just pile up on the file then. I mean, even if black opens the uh, the king side, yeah, it's like white still has extra space there. And the bishop on b7, it's, it's a spectator. So both sides are a little bit stuck in their attacks, or slow to attack, I should say. But I think... When black gets the g5 break, f5 is always waiting to be played. Yeah. And I think that favors white. It does. So black's attack almost looks non-existent here. Unless he's ready to just start sacrificing things. Maybe even like the f pawn needs to push at some point. Yeah. But white now does have this plan. Bishop a6. And if there's a chance to throw this pawn up and sacrifice it with both rooks over there yeah. and the knight coming in, white's going to go for that. So sounds like we both maybe prefer white slightly here, would you say? I think white has the practical chances here. Uh, and an endgame, just imagine all the pieces get traded except for the bishops. This is it, It's still a pretty unhappy French endgame. But th these endgames are never easy to play. That's, that's the problem. Well, I think also in an endgame, black has to be careful because maybe white shifts over to the king side. Yeah. You see that bishop eyeing these uh, kingside pawns. Maybe there's a way to undermine them. So yeah, I think white's got a lot of control here long term. All right, this game we left, I think, with bishop takes f2, if I remember. Or bishop on f2. Where was that? We were right around this oh. point, I think. So material's still even. But white's getting everything well developed. So this is the game position. Bishop G5 okay. was just played. Man, this bishop is just like begging to yeah, get to G5. <laughs> How do I do that without exchanging queens? <laughs> right. So maybe queen D6. 
Maybe you need to take a move and back her up. Yeah, I think... So, again, this is a position where it's hard to just speak generally. I, I, concrete things really matter. But White's King seems to be in more danger. Ooh, that's an interesting move, eh? Does this work? Take. Does this work? Take. Take. Boom. Oh, oh! I was—I thought you were just gonna take the rook over there. No, that's better. Okay, so what was the material count there? So black got a bishop, rook, and queen, and white got the queen and the rook. This is interesting, John. This might win a bishop. That's a crazy line. But then, it, okay, so then the question would be, well, no, I was trying to think, is there like a rook move or something, like rook g1? Because then the queen and the bishop are both on pre, but the bishop can take h4, and that would solve everything. There it is. Jordan Whoa. finds it. Queen takes g5. Um, so I've played Cynical in multiple chess goals events. Cynical is a very strong tactical player. Like, I think he's destroyed me in a couple simuls, too. <laughs> like, I don't even stand a chance against him. But Jordan with the nice find. Um, and I do remember, so we did like a Q&A stream a little while back, and I was doing Puzzle Rush Survival while we were doing the stream. Jordan had like a lot of good solutions in the in those puzzles. Like he, he knows his tactics. And look at that nice find. Queen takes g5. He came to this game at the exact right moment. Yeah, what a find. I mean, yeah, rook takes queen. This is over. What is white? Because there's not going to be like any sort of mate on h8. There's no, t you know, if that rook could somehow <laughs> transport there, that would be crazy. Wow. And black has time to move the king. So I wonder wow. what Jordan's calculating. Probably just making sure he's not getting mated. Queenside castle here. I think that's still an option. The king never moved. Or just, you know, bishop to e5 check, king to d7. Rook slides over. It seizes the, the open file if, if possible. Uh, I don't know. Well, again, you're up a piece, so that's great. Life is good. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, rook h1 down to rook h7. It hits the f pawn. That could be annoying. But our black square bishop is able to easily go to um, f4, take g5. So I'm not too worried. What do you think of this idea? Can, Just like king on g8? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. you're right. I mean, this is an annoying pawn if the rook gets into h7. No, it's got to oh. be better to do this. Like, get the king to d7, park the rook, rook on f8. Rook, yeah, and the then, rooks cancel each other out. Yeah, then get the king up to the middle. That's got to be better for black. Wow, that was good timing. Let's look at that one more time. So here, bishop to g5 just played. Made sense, looking to trade queens. And we were looking at other lines, like queen d6. Yeah. Can we get this to work? Um, but then you notice that that rook is loose, and there's queen takes g5, and there was no checks for white. There was no way out of it. And I yeah, bet that's... Cynical saw that in advance, like right before it was played. That's tough because... Uh... As the white player playing bishop to g5, moving the bishop away, offering exchange of queens, and you're like uh, moving it to a protected square, all of that makes so much sense. And if I'm honest, I probably would not have looked at uh, queen g5. I would have looked at queen trade, queen to d6, and you know, and that'd be it. Uh, so yeah, queen g5. That's that's a gold star right there. Yeah, I think that's really that, good. that was probably like the fourth or fifth move I looked at. I mean, you know, I, you want to look at the trade, you want to look at retreat. Maybe do you have like any crazy sacks? Obviously, you can reject that, but wow, very nice. So now we're in this position, and I think we can almost call this one for black. You know, now it's a matter of technique, but three yeah. points up. And these are going to yeah. be monsters <laughs> with the center yeah, open. Yeah, you already have a pass pawn, so and I don't, I don't see any blockade happening. Wow, what a game. Okay, so that is, let's see, Jordan is on 
team pressed a J. And we've kind of been liking the players on the, the bottom half of the board, which is team pressed to J. So let's go back to this one where Coriolis Ooh, wow. possibly missed that checkmate. So we had this position. You called that move, queen c4. And here's the game. So black is up three points. <laughs> is there a mate, though? Uh, just, no. Uh, does, does queen takes c5 just work? Distracting the queen from b8? Uh, he escapes to d6. It's really close. So bishop g4 will all, is always uh, it's always there. That might be the strongest move. It just looks so simple. Rook to d1. Black can maybe take. Rook d1 right away. Oh, right. Yeah, because the, the rook's not pinned unless the bishop's on g4. Right. But yeah, the combination. Rook, there's. I was wondering, though, like, is there this weird counterplay of c2? Uh, maybe queen can just take it, though. I think, so three minutes on the clock. If I'm playing white here, this is kind of my default move, probably bishop g4, but then I'm, yeah. I'm looking for those quick checkmates, like can I sack the queen or can I sack the rook kind of stuff. Yeah. Because um, rook b8 actually looks pretty good, too. It's two rooks for the queen, but if there was a way you could pick up one more piece in the end somehow. Oh, what about rook takes rook? If queen takes, then bishop g4. So king has to take. And then we have rook d1. Takes rook, king takes rook d1, would win the queen for the rook. Queen takes bishop g4. Okay, bishop g4 okay. first. Bishop I think g4, yeah. The default move. Yeah. This is another one of those really tough positions for black. Like we've talked about, you know, white's kind of the attacker, the gambit player. Um, this is really hard to find a good defensive move. Like somehow you want to transport that h8 rook into the game. Yeah, sure would be nice if we had finished development, you know, 10 moves ago. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Is there some sort of, like, counter blow here that black can go for? I almost want to play queen d1, like, somehow make that work. If the b7 rook... Uh, that can't be good, though. Yeah. That's too much material, right? Rook takes, rook takes... King takes. We're down a queen for bishop and a knight. Yeah. Yeah, that, the, the files, it just looks too open. Queen b5 afterwards. Rook could slide in anywhere on the back rank. Or even just moving the rook to the back rank after king b7. And then I don't know how you develop your king side. Right. So is the main. Is the main threat bishop takes rook or rook takes rook? I guess either of them. Black can't recapture right now. Yeah, it's just this huge material. Like knight e6 isn't a thing because it's pinned. Mm -hmm. The rook is pinned. So half of black's active army. He's really only got the queen to move. Bishop e7 doesn't do anything. I don't even know which way I would take the rook. <laughs> rook takes or bishop takes. They both look good. I mean, I guess rook takes is on the queen with the discovered check. That's probably yeah. the best. Something like I, king to d8, which then allows the knight to take on d7 or to take on b7. It breaks both pins. Oh, I like that. I like that move, king d8. I think it's worth a try, yeah, because then yeah. all of a sudden you have threats. 
Knight takes rook. Yeah, it could all of a sudden be, you know, uh... are these players listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> I did say mute the stream. I said you can watch it. You can have it on, playing in the background, but you should have it muted. <laughs> yeah, a couple times we've uh, called a move, <laughs> and these players see it. But then again, they are on Cheskel's study plan, so, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so how do we continue the attack? Because now there's at least potential of, say, you know, bishop takes, no, bishop takes, that doesn't work. <laughs> but I was trying to imagine, like, a back rank could be an issue. Let's play it very quickly. So king here might kind of walk into that mate we were trying to yeah. set up. King e7. I mean, rookie one check looks very natural. Get that king running. But king f6. So yeah, if you're Coriolis here playing the white pieces, you gotta be a little bit careful. You don't want to overextend your attack so much that the, in the end, there's like multiple threats for the opponent. Because now we're looking at queen d1 check. Yeah. We're looking at this rook potentially being loose if the other rook moves. So we yeah, do the knight's to... not pinned anymore, so it's also possible to jump around. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's probably a good move. Just eliminate this threat. Um, force black to kind of back up and then maybe play rookie one. Yeah, I like that move a lot. There might have been more accurate, but he's got to play practical with three minutes on the clock. Yeah, that's um, exactly what I was thinking. Uh Queen, yeah, or g4 and setting up rook d1. So we have queen blocks, rook d1. If knight, well, if, yeah, if knight blocks, rook d1 wins the queen. Uh, I think there's, you could also, oh yeah, the knight still has to defend the queen too, right? I was trying to look at something like queen to g4, queen e6, then rook to d8, distracting the king, but the knight's also there. Guarding. Yeah, so... We might be able to do like a, some variation on that though. This does give black chances to mess up, which is nice too. Yeah. So, so queen b5 with the same idea, because then checks would then run into the rook d8 ideas. Uh, yeah, and if king c7, you check again. Yeah. Distracting the king away. And this does defend the rook and... Okay, this might be the best move. This looks really good now. Queen b5, because we have this rook e8 check idea. And rook e1. Yeah. If the rook... I mean, it's almost immaterial, but if the rook is on e1, then that means any queen to d1 ideas would never be check. And so that's... That's always nice. Yeah, so let's say I don't even know where the black. Yeah, the frustrating is. part is the king is like he's cornered, but he's not like he's not right there. All right, taking on c three. I mean, maybe Coriolis is doing the right thing here. We're looking for these immediate blows, but yeah, we do have to Take keep away. factor the clock in. Yeah, now there's no c two c one shenanigans, and Black still needs to find a move, and the most natural move, Bishop e seven. Well, a yeah, the rook's hanging, and there's also uh, the the g pawn is hanging, so you can't play g six and bishop g seven. Yeah, so it's a position where white's probably, you know, still winning according to Stockfish, and you don't have to do anything quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't mind this move. Queen takes c three. All right, let's jump to board four. I think I'm still feeling pretty confident that white's going to win this game. Okay, so we lost white lost the e pawn and the some sort of trade pawn for pawn. Okay, so yeah, and, got and a bishop, I think. What do you lose the bishop? Mm. Ooh, that's not good. Fifty cent lost the bishop. Bishop a five. The clock yeah. was getting low. But 
Yeah. And uh, again, it's really easy to look at a move like that and say, oh, I just missed it. But a big part of that was the bishop was bad for the entire game. Like it, it never really had anything. And so you finally find an active way to get it in. And then it it's there. So this is kind of where, um, when I'm looking through my games, I try and never just say, I hung a piece. Whoops, that's it. That was my, you know, that's the takeaway as, as you uh, you call them. Is like, like, what led to that? Why did I get into a position where um, I thought that was a move that could have been played? And a big part of that was pretty much this entire game, the bishop never had a good spot. It was always dominated by that c4 knight. Uh, right? And where does that bishop go? Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, there was never a chance to get on the other diagonals. And I think you're exactly right. You know, we can't just say, hey, it's a blunder. Silly mistake. It won't happen again. Um, we have to always analyze what was it in the position that made the blunder more likely to happen? Because there's almost always something, whether it's you were playing too passive. Uh, usually it's a comfort level. You were uncomfortable in the position. That's what made you make the mistake. And I agree with Jonathan. I think it's because the dark bishop was kind of bad all game long. That's what led to this mistake. So probably the takeaway would be figuring out, you know, maybe even going back to this position. You know, how do we keep this bishop active? And maybe it goes to e5 even, right? Like maybe f3 is a better move here. But once that bishop got bad, I think white was uncomfortable with what to do with that piece the rest of the game. And to be perfectly fair, uh, I did not anticipate that around this position. We were saying that black, you know, oh, we didn't like that. And it's very subtle about how difficult uh, this position became for white. This is not an obvious uh, drop tactic, right? This was, uh, this was tough. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe f3 should be played, but there is still the bishop takes c3 idea for black. But the nice thing with f3, and there we see your resignation. The nice thing with f3 in that position is I feel like, um, get back to there. You know, I feel like if you get this position, everything is being controlled outside of that bishop on b4. So if takes, yeah. takes happens, look at this knight and bishop trying to get into the game and compare that to the knight and bishop for white. Yeah. Now bishop f4 hits c7. This is a much better version for white. We can see that almost all the pawns are on light squares now. Mm -hmm. So that, um, and that's that's a big reason for it. And I, I'm going to freely admit that I did not um, uh, appreciate, you know, pawn color and bishops for a surprisingly long period of time. So I knew there were good bishops, I knew there were bad bishops, but I didn't really make decisions based on that. Uh, this here is, uh, is, is, is a pretty good example, I think, of exactly why just that one pawn from e4 to e5 makes that bishop so much better. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's those subtle things that, you know, so, um, you know, you look at different things that you have to learn as you go up the levels. Those subtle things don't matter as much at like a 1300 level, but they definitely start to matter more when you get 15, 1600. Um, and here that it did actually matter. But none, even like even we weren't thinking about it at the time. But you want to watch those things. You want to watch those imbalances, bad bishops, good bishops, because that usually makes it more likely that one side will blunder because of those positional deficiencies. Oh, I just we yeah. saw a result here. Okay, this happened oh, wow. really quick. Oh. Okay, so we had where did we leave it? Bishop or queen e two. So that, so this was really nice by white. So we just saw queen e2, king b8, and then knight b3, and all of a sudden the attack is coming through for white that quickly. Yeah, last attack, h5, just got to try something, but you're hitting at air right now. And look at this, white doesn't even want the knight. It can't go anywhere. Yeah, that's really good, actually. Yeah. 
Oh wow, yeah, he's keeping this bishop completely boxed in on h8 on a8. Now he grabs the pawn. So this was a flag by black, but yeah, this position looks like white's really in control. Yeah, I don't know though. Do you feel it's completely over or do you think black has a little bit to play for still? I hate resigning in a position like this. Like, okay, my position might suck, but prove it to me, right? How do you break through? And uh, you could easily imagine uh, the black queen suddenly coming to d5, and then there's counter chances on the other diagonal. So what is the white breakthrough? Is there an immediate rook takes b6? So let's say like rook e8. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Is it take, take. I don't think so. No. And even if we double on the B file, like the bishop on B site and every, the control on the seventh rank, it looks like it defends everything. Now, white still has everything to play for. And maybe something along the lines of bishop to D3, bishop to E4, forcing the trade. Because then, once that bishop's gone, now, and then, then the queen's on the long diagonal, that could be tough. But still, I don't see an immediate breakthrough. Yeah, we'll have to see if Bob comes into the chat, because I think there is something to play for here for black. I'm going to take a quick peek at the eval. What's your guess? What do you think the eval is? Uh, what's material? Is it even? One, two, three, four, five, uh, plus six. one for white. Plus one for white. White's got the space advantage. Uh, there might be a C pawn. I'd say, darn it, it's always tough. I'm going, uh, let's go 1.4, white. I was going to say plus two. I bet you're closer, though. Oh, 1.06. Okay, so one thing that uh, you have to be aware of in this position, too, is the black has a passed pawn, right? So if too much stuff gets traded off, like say this goes into a rook and pawn endgame, black's definitely got something to play for. Yeah, good well played game by both sides. Uh, there was a lot of us shifting our ideas on who's doing better because the players just found like really nice plans. Uh, but yeah, press... I think, go ahead, sir. Um, black shifting into defensive mode here rather than continuing with h5, h6, or anything else. Getting his rooks, especially the rook on the seventh rank there, that looked really good. Yeah, the way he, it looked funny, but the way he got everything around his king, he was ready for white's attacks. Yeah, I, I read it some, I can't remember who said it, but um, a Fianchetto Rook is an amazing defender because it controls every sacrifice. Okay. Because you can, no matter where you try and sacrifice, the Rook is there as well. It makes sense. Yeah. So I'm it's, looking... not, it's not ideal, right? I mean, you'd much rather have your Rook doubled on the seventh rank, but um, there we go. Yeah, these rooks do a really nice job defending. I'm looking at this position now, wondering maybe the imbalance white should have gone for is knight against bishop. Get the knight to d6? Yeah. Because I really like that knight on d6. I mean, I suppose black could always try to sack a rook for it, but... Then white has the material advantage. Mm -hmm. And you have that to play for. And this bishop isn't too scary unless another piece can join the attack, which I don't see happening anytime soon. So maybe there was something there with the imbalances where this white bishop just couldn't create enough play after knight takes, pawn takes. Okay, so we have a 2-0 lead for Team Presta J with two games remaining. Um, I see a couple of the players are in the YouTube chat. Uh, Safuya said, was really struggling in the opening, found it tough to untangle. That was in the game against 50 Cent. And then uh, 50 Cent said he just plugged in and heard us talking about good and bad. Bishop's really good insight. Yeah, that was a good game, guys. Um, definitely go back and watch the earlier parts later if you're interested. Let's see, Bob is here. I've actually been really impressed with all the games. Um, I don't know about accuracy. I mean, that's always to find out afterwards. But just from a spectator uh, standpoint, I, there, maybe it's because no one played the London system. But... It, there, there were dynamic games. They were all quite interesting right off the bat. 
And it's not as if, I don't know if there was an instance where we said, oh, this person's clearly winning, or we clearly prefer this player, um, and it stayed that way the entire time. I, I, every time you shifted to a new game, it was like, it's a new adventure. Yeah. Yeah, really exciting games. Um, nothing was dry, and I feel like a high level of play, too. Like, a lot of nice ideas have been found. Funny enough, it's kind of hard for Black to untangle in this exact spot. Uh, because if he moves the king, the, bish uh, the bishop on e8 is either pinned or hanging. And if he plays rook e6, the knight jumps back to d5, or I guess to c c5 is even better, of course. So, and the pawns are blockaded up the white squares. Uh, this might be an instance where uh, we said Black was winning. It was a matter of technique. Mm -hmm. uh, he might have pushed the pawns a little bit too early. I still think Black is doing absolutely fine. But uh, I think this is a bit, a bit harder than it could have been. This would be my plan, I think. It's really slow, but I agree with you. I think... White's doing a nice job tying black down. I, I got, think you got to get the rook on c8 mm. and get this bishop moved. That's causing you all the problems here if you're black. But I think we mentioned how the f7 pawn was annoying to defend. And we could see how, uh, okay, leaving the king on f8 wasn't the best idea, we thought. But then it turns out the bishop on e8 isn't very happy either. Yes, yeah, so maybe we should back up and see how we got to this position. Uh, so we had, we were right here. This was after the really nice sacrifice, the queen sack. Yeah. Actually, let's show it. So a couple players just joined this uh, stream who finished their games. Let's show this position to them. So here we had queen e5, and black had been kind of attacking the king for the last half dozen moves. Bishop g5 is played, and we were looking at this position thinking, okay, nice move, right? Put the bishop on a solid square, offer the queen trade. If the queens come off, that really is going to neutralize any advantages that black has here, or at least, you know, the immediate attacks. And then we were looking at this, and this idea popped into our minds. Queen takes g5, and we calculated it out, and Jordan found it, and it looked like, by force, uh, black was just winning that bishop after this exchange. But then the question was, how do we convert this as black? And we realized, you know, this rook is coming down to h7. If you could get to h8 in one move, it'd be checkmate. Ooh. So I'm thinking, uh, back up one move? Yeah. And so if we were to play e5 here, the bishop attacks g4, it can come there with check, and then it could slide down to um, h5 afterwards, sealing the h file. Very good idea. Very nice. Because if king f3, uh, we could always even... Well, what would we do with king f3, I guess? Well, just move the bishop to. So we we, we have played eight um, e5. Yeah. So if we go e5. So if we play e5, the bishop can easily go to f4 and then just take the. Uh... Oh right, we have. Um... This is so annoying. Guess, yeah, it's still annoying, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's like one move too slow. Um, but there might be something here still. So. so I guess just king d8 and then bishop goes to e8. And the bishop's on e8 again. But our bishop on f4 is going to take g5. It'll then take f6. That's true. That's coming really quickly. And once those pawns are gone, I, the, the real thorn in black side. But you know what? There's nothing harder to win than a one game. That is true. Especially when your opponent you know, does a good job looking for all this counterplay. Like here, I'm actually wondering if e5 should have been played. Hmm. That seems like a critical moment to do it. It's okay to lose the bishop pair here. Yeah. Because now we get our king to e6. We don't mind trades at all. And here again, I think I would go e5. And still bring the king up to e6. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just jump ahead to the game position. So now we see c4, and white's actually playing active here. Uh, Cynical is not happy to just sit back and wait. Wow, c4, what a move. Maybe it was forced because b2 was just hanging. You know what I'm looking at? Knight e6 check ideas followed by f7. Hmm. So let's say here, check if black had to take f7. 
So I, I love that just because it shows how chess is such a cruel game <laughs> yes. where you could be clearly in the driver's seat and then you find a brilliant queen sacrifice and then there's this silly f7 that comes and you know possibly ruins your day that's um so easy to lose focus there yeah that's that was that was very nice and that yeah to me that's one of the most beautiful things with chess too is like if you are a high rated player in the scenario you can create those chances right where it's like anything can happen even if you're down a piece just slowly build your position create more pressure and your opponent might miss something and here we see white's king getting very active i'm not feeling very confident for black anymore you know black should be better black should be winning yeah. but i don't know anymore so we need bishop takes b2 yeah bishop takes b2 the c pawn's very fast and uh, the rook can always take on e6, so that isn't a, uh, an issue. And I don't see how white's king, though as active as can be, can come forward and do anything. And this doesn't do anything. There's always check. Okay, yeah, maybe this is still secure for black. Pushing the C pawn is very straightforward. Yeah, that's. So I'm assuming White still wants to get the king active, um, and maybe try to get the knight to d6. But I suppose Black could always just sack on d6 if the you know, pawn's about to queen. Yeah, that's the nice thing about being up material. You can always give it back. Yeah. Okay, so this is looking like a win for Jordan now. I, th I think maybe White needs to even just drop this rook back in order to get a little bit of play. Yeah. But the king is pretty safe back here. Yeah, uh, as annoying as the rook on h8 is, and it is, it, you, he only has one other knight, and then Black has his bishop and his rook and, and a c-pawn now. And so, okay. Yeah, I don't feel like this move does much unless I'm missing the idea. Oh, he maybe wants knight e6 still. Like Push the rook away? Yeah, maybe he wants this rook to come up somewhere and then knight e6. But is knight e6 as big of a threat mm -hmm. anymore? Maybe not. Oh, we have another result. Coriolis got the win. Oh, he... <laughs> securing the match how did this one finish so we left i think right around here yeah h5 queen f3 i mean i like how coriolis is just sort of like keeping all the activity yeah. rook d1 as well oh yeah rook d1 threatening to win the queen rook d1 This is tricky. There's bishop d6. Has to be calculated. So I think at the very least exchange everything, win the rook in the corner, and then you're up in exchange. Yeah, that's a smooth conversion. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm boring that way. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> it's, actually, isn't there a, a Russian, uh, the old Russian proverb, is if you're calculating a mate or you're calculating winning a queen, it's like, you take the queen, because the queen's a queen. And if you uh, mess up anything during the mate, then you lose the game. And so you take the sure thing, right, or the very likely a sure thing, rather than going for glory. So which order is the sure thing? Well, trying to find something else than exchanging on d6, right? Trying to do anything, like, I don't even know what else there would be. But when I see an end, it's, it's funny, I don't even like end games. Uh -huh. I think end games are terrible, but if there's a winning one or a very good one, you know, you, you go into it. Yeah, that's true. So I think uh, I think you have to play rook takes here, because if queen takes, and I see Coriolis is in the chat saying, with a minute on the clock, I could barely calculate anything. <laughs> so if oh, yeah, here, that's tough. take, take, rook takes, the king could take this rook. Oh, I see. 
So I think after bishop here, you have to take with the rook, and you have to calculate queen check. Fortunately, we've got rook comes back to d1, discovered check. Exactly. <laughs> That's complicated. Okay, so king c6 was played. Wow, look at now this. Now this looks bad. Yeah. Controlling all of these rank or uh, files. Was queen b3 just mate in one? Did I miss something? Is the knight's pinned? Oh, very nice. It is mate in one. Oh, so Coriolis, we have to show you this mate earlier. Let's go get to the end of the game. Yeah, let's finish the game off here. Oh, rook sack with queen b3 next. Oh. If bishop takes. Oh, you, you get bonus points for that. That's uh... a. <laughs> Good finish, Coriolis. <laughs> All right, so where was our checkmate? Oh, this position. Uh, right around, instead of queen takes f7. Yeah, right here. OK, so Nicolas in the chat. Do you see there's a forced mate sequence here for you? See if you it's can It's not queen it. takes f7. That's a hint. A win's a win, says Sideshow Bob. No, it is. And one of the nice things, well, from a spectator, maybe not from a player, is that when you miss the mate, then the game became complicated again. And again, there, there were chances and it had to keep going. And so um, by not winning instantly, um, it actually became more instructive. One, there's now a mate puzzle we can actually look at. And two, we can see what were the defensive resources that Black might have had. Did Black have a chance or is this still just crushing? And so... Um, there's much more to analyze now. Yeah. So he's saying rook b8, bishop b7, check, queen c6. Oh, wow. Does so I work? think the, the knight guard c6 after taking. Should I say the answer? Let's do it. Bishop takes d7, check. Queen still guards the rook. So rook has to take back, and then queen c6 check. The only options are rook black and king over, and both of them the queen will mate right in front of the king. <laughs> Press to J. Yeah, and I think nowadays, so are you reading the YouTube chat too? Or no? Me? Yeah. Or no. Oh, so Presta J said, that's a great anecdote, Smithy Q. Whenever I miss a mate, I'll say I was doing it for the spectators <laughs> with a tongue out face. I was going to say, nowadays it's called like throwing for content, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but what I do appreciate, like even though you missed the checkmate, Nicolas, um, everything you did was so smooth after that. Like you're down two or three points the rest of this game in terms of material, but you completely tied down that h8 rook and f8 bishop. And I just felt you played so solid that you really never gave Black any chance to get back into the game. I think this was the one moment where I thought maybe Bishop d6, uh, but both players were down to like a minute on the clock. So I think you still played really well, even after missing that mate. Yeah, I, that was my early uh, my early pick for exciting or more most interesting game. Um, certainly, like, I think in the first six moves. But the other games uh, lived up as well, so I'd have to look at them all again before I decide <laughs> my favorite. Oh yeah, we should pick like a exciting game of the match. That'd be fun. Brilliancy prize, right? <laughs> yeah. What would the prize be? <laughs> <laughs> so here, let's see. Jordan's plus four. Okay, so Cynical got the king back in front of that passed pawn. Now this rook isn't looking as valuable. Yeah. But he's still making a game of it, right? He got he blocked the pass pawn, and his rook and knight will be active. Yeah, I don't know if anyone ever plays against Stockfish in these completely winning end games, and then you just find out how the engines are able to put up so much resistance. It's almost unfair. Um, it's really good practice for positions like this, where you just. What you do is just try and give your opponent the most uh, problems he can. And I think White's done a very good job of that. This could have been, you know, resignable, but uh, we're really making uh, black work for this uh, for this game here. 
Because what move number was queen takes g5? Move 20. And we are now on move 45. So we've seen 25 moves from a position that honestly just looked completely lost. Like I would almost consider resigning it from White's point of view. Um, but if you look at what he's done, I mean, he's made a game out of this. It's still not 100% clear if Black will be able to finish. And you look at the clocks, that's going to be another big factor. It only takes one knight fork, one skewer, yeah. and White's back in the game. Seventeen seconds. Rook d eight check. Knight check. Uh, you really don't want this king to take and tuck on g seven. Yeah, that's okay. I like that move. It's a good practical decision. Oh, but that's a nice reply. That's a really there. nice reply. There we go. And we see the resignation. Yeah. Good game, guys. That was a fun one. Jordan, really sick sacrifice. Queen takes g5. Yeah. Move 20. So I think, to me, this is probably still the most exciting game of the match. I think this move, I would give the brilliancy prize. But Oh, yes. this I um, Of all the moves we looked at, individual moves, this, I mean, how do you say no to a queen sacrifice, especially one that's not obvious? Yeah. Right? That was uh, very, very nice. This, this whole game, actually, uh, like we, we talked about how chaos would favor black, just judging by the first eight moves. And well, I guess a queen sacrifice, right? Leading there, that's that's pretty much that's pretty chaotic right there. Because around here, we thought that this was sort of a bad looking French for black. Yeah. But one thing we said was the one advantage that black has in terms of the imbalances is the lack of king safety for white. So a lot of times you get into these French structures, uh, the black king will go to the queen side, which ended up happening, and he's actually pretty safe there. And sometimes black can get like the open F file and start attacking. So if you look at the next few moves, D takes C. This might be one to kind of go back and look at for cynical, um, because I think this was the start of black getting some activity. Like maybe here knight E2 could be played play a bit more solid in the center. Um, but I don't know, is this pawn dropping right away? Maybe it is. Uh, do, yeah, there are various F takes E6 trying to open up a diagonal for the uh, for the ultimate queen discovery check. That was so thematic. So, like, I don't know if we just put on the board here or back up one move. Like right here. Uh, so after bishop to d3, mm -hmm. right? The whole idea of uh, uh, c takes d4, c takes d4, queen takes d4, right? Well, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, yeah, none of those work right away, but after f takes e6. Oh, yeah, f takes e6 here. No checks for black in whichever way black takes. There's a check with the bishop. That's kind of what we were looking at. Yeah, though so I guess... I think the move order has to change because queen takes e5 comes with check now. So right here, f takes e. Yeah. Yeah, so we didn't think black had the free pawn because of this line. Um, whichever way black takes, and then white takes here, and it's not safe to capture the pawn. And if queen takes, then pawn takes back, and this and pawn's weak. We're pretty happy, yeah. But at the same time... <laughs> uh, eight moves of the pawns in the first eight moves. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, this was a good game, though. This was a really fun game. I liked it. So that was the, uh, let's see. That was the fourth game. I forgot to do the scoreboard. Jordan won. So if we look at the scoreboard, Team Presta J went 4-0 and today. They won every single game. And early on, I remember we did like that kind of around the horn where we just looked at each game. Yeah. We actually felt like Presta J's team had a small edge in all four games. And they ended up holding. And, and actually, if we kind of go back and mentally think about each of those games, I don't think they really ever gave Team Sideshow the advantage in any of those games, at least not anything significant. No, I think it went from we really like one side to it's more even slash it's unclear. 
very rarely did I think, okay, now I'm looking at the other side. Yeah. Really good job, everyone. So we're at about, let's see, hour and 50 minute mark. Um, Jonathan, I appreciate you commentating with me. This was a lot of fun. It's one of the fastest two hours I've had lately. So uh, I really enjoyed that. The, the quality of chess, you know, it, it was good. It was exciting. I kind of thought like, oh, frig, after 45 minutes, I was thinking about this in my head. It's like, oh, dear. It's like the 16th London system game. And then everyone's <laughs> trading everything off. But no, this was it, was, it was exciting. It was fun. And having four games like, was a very good amount, I think because we were able to still remember all the games. It's not like we had to, you doing a simul where you're trying to remember all 16 games and then you come back. I don't even remember <laughs> what about when this game started. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed this. Yeah, this this was awesome. And we've done um, we've done up to six games before. And I feel like that's about the limit because Probably. one nice thing with doing four games is we went a lot more in depth today than mm -hmm. I've done in any of the other team matches. Because when you have six, you're just constantly kind of flipping. Uh, but this was great. This was a lot of fun. So thanks everyone for watching. Um, thanks for playing. Yeah, and thanks for playing as well. All right, thanks Jonathan. Have a good day everyone. Take care. Bye.